I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're becoming an Emissary of the Firekeeper and collecting powerful souls, as I rank the bosses of Dark Souls Arch Thrones. For those not in the know, Arch Thrones is a Dark Souls 3 mod that's had a massive amount of community backing over the last few years. It features a brand new plot, a whole host of new NPCs that are fully voice acted, new weapons, features from across FromSoft's various games, a whole host of brand new bosses and arch thrones to explore, and while I won't be mentioning them during their bosses' respective entries, there's an entirely unique soundtrack that is beautifully composed by Solus Composer and enhances every fight in the demo you'll be listening to it throughout the video. It follows the Demon Souls formula of having five different worlds to explore via the Nexus of Embers, and the demo contains the first area of each Arch Throne. More than enough content to get your Soulsborn fix before Shadow of the Erd Tree launches in a few months. If you're new to my channel, I just want to clarify I am not an expert Souls player, I lean more towards a casual perspective, and my opinions are only being based on my experience with my first playthrough of this demo. And let me just say this, I don't play a lot of modded content, but Arch Thrones is absolutely fabulous. The work of this team is astounding, and my praise and critiques are seriously coming from a place of genuine love and adoration. We need more teams like this in the modded community, it's fantastic. So without further ado, all 19 Dark Souls Arch Thrones demo bosses ranked. Let me know your favourite down below. At number 19, we have the Carthus Sandworm, found throughout the Arch Throne of the High Lord, but fought in a small arena off to the side of the desert. Unlike the rest of the fights in the game, which take elements of prior and later Soulsborne games and update them, the Carthus Sandworm is identical to its appearance in Dark Souls 3. Avoid the worm as it slithers around, and once it comes to a stop, smack the flesh and watch the health bar plummet. I was expecting some sort of gotcha moment or a surprise attack that would make me rethink my strategy, but no, you get the sandworm to half health and then it leaves, granting you a reward in the form of an Estus Shard and the Lightning Spear Incantation. I suspect that the sandworm might be a recurring appearance in the Arch Throne of the High Lord, and eventually we will get to slay the beast in a proper boss fight. Killing it now would ruin the cinematics of seeing it harass the desert's inhabitants near the oasis after all. But for now, it lands at the bottom of the list, and I don't think anyone's going to disagree here. At number 18, we have Sir Florian of the Blue Sentinels and Warden Jessa of the Pit of Sinners. This is a hidden boss fight that occurs after being invaded by two familiarly named Red Phantoms throughout Phoenix Tower. Sir Florian and Warden Jessa will then appear to help you, and once your invaders are vanquished, can be found in Quela's chamber. I'm unsure if you need to be in the Way of the Blue Covenant for this to take effect, but that's what I did. From there, talk to Sir Florian and obtain the Sleep Gesture, and then use it in front of Quela to start the fight. Now, the actual battle ended up being extremely easy, as at no point were the pair aggressive at the same time. One would always play a passive role until the other finished their combo string, rinse and repeat. There's another boss later that pulls the same trope, but I think to a much better effect. Here, their movesets are a little too easy to dodge and punish for them to put up much of a fight solo. Yes, I kept dodging backwards from Warden Jessa when I should have dodged inwards, I'll take that L, but I was playing a strength build, and once I saw I could tank the hits, I pressed on without remorse, since their poise wasn't exactly anything terrifying. Sir Florian's attacks were fun to avoid using the Nox Swordstress moveset from Elden Ring, which would have translated better had his attacks been a tad faster. Still, seeing the various assets from Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring throughout this mod is mind-blowing, and never fails to make me smile when I recognise a moveset or reference. That being said, this is an instance where both bosses just need to be a little more aggressive overall. I had moments where Sir Florian would be walking away, back turned from me, which was funny, but clearly not intended. 
I like these two, and I hope they get a little buff to make them more of a challenge, as if you defeat them, you get access to the boss rematch system, ooh. At number 17, we have the Great Deep Accursed, found in the depths of the Cathedral of the Deep, in the Arch Throne of the Xanthus Scholars. I'll admit, part of this low ranking is because the Great Deep Accursed is based on the Bloodletting Beast from Bloodborne's Chalice Dungeons, and I recently just went through and ranked those bosses in a video, so I had that sensation of, oh, this feels a bit samey. The design is top notch, this accursed with bones sprouting out the back gave me Guardian 8 vibes upon entering, and the design of the arena with all the blood really stood out given we'd just been in an otherworldly cathedral with hues of blue and teal, only to be met with this crimson blood expanse. Initially, I tried locking onto the head so I could hit the weak point of the boss, but all that did was take my camera for a nauseating ride never again. The boss just didn't have any standout moments in the first half of the fight, being your bog standard melee based moveset, and once the centipede controlling the beast emerged, the main new move it gained was one that immediately made me groan. I'm very vocal about just not being a fan of the curse status in Dark Souls. I think status effects are important and can really benefit a boss fight if used well, think the poison in the blood starved beast fight in Bloodborne is a great example. But insta-kill status effects have just never felt good to me personally. I could be doing perfectly up to the halfway point, and then one mistimed roll or two could see me cursed back to the last bonfire. Now this would be fine and totally cool if the run back to this boss was quick and painless, as if you're going to use a mechanic that can easily kill players for putting a few feet wrong, they shouldn't then be doubly punished by dealing with a difficult run back. But the route to the Great Deep Accursed is lengthy and filled with enemies that use ranged magic to attack you from behind, so once you run past them, you have to pray you're not about to get sniped midway through a room filled with half a dozen kin. A definite positive, I will say, is that the fight is extremely well balanced for its spot in the game. I used all my Estus and just barely managed to clinch a win, which is exactly how I love my boss fights to be. Fabulous job. Look, Curse just isn't my cup of tea, but I fully respect that it does fit the theming of the area, and hell, you do find purging stones in the demo which can be used to mitigate its buildup. And the Soul Curse attack is a vomit that you can avoid, so perhaps the other players will get more mileage out of this one than me, and that's totally cool. At number 16, we have the Pus Ridden Beast, found on a hidden path near the Stables Bonfire in the Upper War Torn Village. So I have to admit something. Of all the bosses in the demo, the Pus Ridden Beast was the only fight that I severely regretted the way I handled it. Introduced with a guttural screech, I immediately start thinking, okay, Cleric Beast, I can handle that. Only as the fight hits its final stages, it collapses and reveals Lawrence the first vicar instead. My problem was that this was the first boss I found in the demo. I read a message saying to use fire, used a charcoal pine item that lasted for about 5 seconds, got fucked up in the first 15 seconds, and figured I should come back after leveling up. Then, after beating the Angelic Siege Golem boss later in the zone, I thought I was ready to take on the Pus Ridden Beast. I wasn't. Despite having leveled up, I returned to see my damage still roughly the same as before, and the amount of health lost per hit the same as before. So I cheesed the fight with firebombs, thinking this was what was intended, as I'd seen multiple player messages telling me to use fire, and I had a large stock of them in my inventory. I feel like I sinned. Had I come back after doing the Cathedral, or even after doing Carthus, I would have had a much easier time, more in line with the rest of the boss roster. But right as I was feeling bad about my strategy, I then saw the pus ridden beast utilize Curse in its crawling state, and the level of fear that ran through me when I realized those firebombs could have been used for nothing, oof. Sometimes a boss fight just doesn't really click with you, and for me, that's the pus ridden beast but I can tell there's something there, so I'm gonna give it a proper attempt next time I play without any firebomb cheese, whenever that may be. At number 15, we have the Chaos Amalgamate, found in the Carthus Red Mine. 
Despite the low placement on today's list, I feel this is where the fights truly start to skyrocket in quality. Maybe I'm just easy to impress, because I fully enjoyed every aspect of this boss battle. The design is perfect, a decayed, rotting series of corpses strung together by Obadiah's necromancy, embedded with the very red crystals that the mine supplies. It tells a story and feels so different to anything we fought up to this point. It initially seems unassuming, going with the usual swipes you'd expect from an enemy of this type, and it staggered pretty easily, I could tell I was at the proper level based on my damage. Then the enemy jumps, charges a flame-based AoE, and launches lava puddles across the room. I was thrilled! Pyromancy being such an important aspect of Karthus was being represented across its bosses, even down to the amalgamate's flaming weapons. That being said, the boss's moveset, despite this flair, ended up feeling very samey throughout the fight. It would constantly slam down its war pick as opposed to using its curved blade, and that slam made it very difficult to approach the boss from the front. And with that same style of slam being used over and over and over again, it just started to feel repetitive. I needed a different type of move to break up the monotony, if that makes any sense. But now, I just want to know more about those red crystals that were being mined. Is it something that'll be expanded upon in a future zone? They clearly gave the boss fire-based abilities. Questions that need answers, Arch Thrones. At number 14, we have the Omen of the Eclipse, found in the chasm beneath the war-torn village. Now, when I first encountered this fight, I genuinely thought it was going to be in my top five, because I remember seeing this imposing military figure in this giant underground arena and thinking, damn. And then he starts with the Godfrey axe throw, I mean, come on. Golden Shade Godfrey mixed with a pus creature was not what I was expecting on my bingo card. When I first encountered this fight, I was definitely too low level to pass it, opting to use my Charcoal Pine Resin because the boss had a clear weakness to fire, while tanking a ton of hits because I figured if I was doing that kind of damage, I could finish the boss without needing to think strategically. Little did I know that because I wasn't learning the initial moveset, I was wasting all of my Estus on what would end up being a Phase 1. I should have seen Phase 2 coming, as the arena was way too big for this one man, but a pus-ridden, ulcerated tree spirit from Elden Ring was the last thing I was expecting. It killed me, and I realized, yeah, no, I need to come back to this later. Only, I believe I left it a tad too long, as when I came back, I blitzed through the first phase, and the second phase didn't give me much trouble. In fact, I think phase two is easier overall, as the large hitbox of the boss gives you more room to strike. And even in Elden Ring, I found the ulcerated tree spirit's main lunges and charges easy to dodge through and avoid. Sure, you'll still get whacked by a tail or two, but it's not as hard as other bosses in this mod. I think why the omen is in the bottom half of my list now comes from the fact that it's not as memorable long term. Its arena, while vast, doesn't have a lot of aesthetic to it beyond an underground cavern with water on the floor. I think had the arena been filled with some decoration, or perhaps some pus and infection to signify the corruption that's spreading under the earth, it would have resonated more. It feels like an unfinished boss arena, if that makes any sense. The best comparison would be to Saint Klimt from the Cathedral. He's a similar style of boss, starting humanoid before turning into a monstrosity, only his boss arena is this candlelit blood altar that contrasts with the rest of the zone he's in. The omen, meanwhile, is in a cave, that's about it. Hopefully that gets my point across without me being too brutal, I'm sorry. That, and I think after doing a 100% run of Elden Ring, the ulcerated tree spirit just doesn't hit as hard as it used to, but I think different players will, once again, get better mileage out of him. At number 13, we have the Demon Vanguard from the tutorial, the next evolution of the tutorial demon trope. Firstly, I just want to appreciate the level of detail on this boss. The monster design is top-notch, with those large, beady eyes and the almost insectoid-looking carapaces throughout. The fight itself starts off standard, the usual slow axe swings that I don't need to tell you how to roll through, as well as the butt slam, making their triumphant returns. Initially, I was expecting this to be an updated version of the Vanguard from Demon Souls, even down to the identical name, but then at half health, he crumbles. 
suddenly lava is pooling beneath him, and he gains three new attacks. The first is a forward fist slam, easy to avoid. The second is a three strike combo that almost certainly will kill some players. Spoilers, it got me in my first playthrough. Thirdly, he'll move from left to right, spewing fireballs that do around half your health of damage. The trick to beating him is that his head is a weak spot. It takes extra damage, so smack it enough with a two-handed broadsword and the demon vanguard goes down. Now admittedly, I don't really like that defeating the boss still ends in you dying, just to the explosion of energy from the boss's defeat. I prefer the Demon Souls method where you survive the fight, but then get defeated by something more brutal later on. It's not the only time this method is used to end a boss fight in the demo either, but at least you get the soul of the boss once you arrive in the Nexus, which you can transpose for a fancy colossal great axe. Easily my favourite of the tutorial demons I faced, and as such, it earns a nice middle of the pack finish. I just hope that the boss appears at some point later in the full game, so anyone who didn't get its boss soul can have a chance to obtain its boss weapon. Given they did that in Demon Souls though, Arch Thrones will probably do the same. At number 12, we have Silver Knight Captain Erdan, found after going through the barracks of Elium Lois. For context, Elium Lois was the last area I chose to explore because I felt the enemies there were the most oppressive for being underleveled. As such, I ran into Erdan very late into my playthrough, and even then he gave me a run for my money. I was using the old greatsword from the cathedral, and this was where the weapon started to feel like it was dropping off in damage. I had to carefully time my dodges to each sword swing, sometimes I'd try to time a shield counter because I could tell the fight wanted me to do that, but I never quite clicked with the secular mechanics in the demo, definitely something I need to practice with. Instead, I took to learning the combos, figuring out which ones were safe to attack and which weren't. Reminded me of a fighting game mentality as opposed to a Souls game. With my weapon, I was able to build up a lot of stagger damage and occasional bleed damage, so when he entered his second phase and began charging up his flame blade, I wasn't worried. He mainly used the same moves from phase 1, but with some extra spice which made him easy to learn and eventually overcome, though I will freely admit to absolutely whiffing it every single time he did the forward thrust. For some reason, the delay on that attack always got me and I panic rolled right into his hands. He felt like the premium armoured knight boss of the demo, he doesn't do anything insane, just uses a predictable move set with a few delayed timings and long combo strings to promote difficulty and that's more than enough to put a smile on my face. I had a lot of fun with Erdan, and I thought I'd be ranking him higher to be honest, but I've always been a player that prefers unique qualities and spectacle in a fight, and I'd say the other fights on today's list all have moments that blew my mind or surprised me. Erdan didn't really have that, but he did have what I'd consider to be a perfectly balanced fight. At number 11, we have the Disgraced Knight, found at the end of Phoenix Tower. A blade of the Dark Moon who fell from grace due to abhorrent thoughts, and now he guards the entrance to the Pit of Sinners. First things first, his weapon and design are top notch, I love the armour which looks weathered by wear, and his weapon has such an interesting curved design befitting of the Blades of the Dark Moon. In battle, his first phase takes the form of Great Shinobi Owl from Sekiro, utilising shuriken and sword strikes to confuse the player. And instead of anti-healing bombs, we have him now blowing the dust of a Lloyd's Talisman. It has the same effect, blocking your Estus, but fits the themes of Dark Souls much better. The first half of the fight felt manageable with my first weapon, the Great Sword, as I could block a lot of the attacks, and I knew which ones I could safely punish, thank god I enjoy Owl's moveset. But that all went out of the window once he hit half health, as he summons the power of the Dark Moon, creating Dark Moon slashes that do heavy amounts of damage and blowing spectral powder that explodes in midair. Which, by the way, he likes to use at the end of combos that once were safe, and I kept falling for it every single time. I had to switch to a great mace around this point in the playthrough to get the damage output I was after because I could tell my sword was just not cutting it anymore, and this was when I realised this boss could be poise broken. Naturally, this gave me the edge I sorely needed to finish off the fight. The only aspect of this boss I didn't really like was the deflect mechanic, as sometimes I'd see openings to strike only for the boss to deflect me and counterattack. 
It's part of the Sekiro inspiration for the mod, which is admittedly my least favourite aspect of the kit, but Phoenix Tower does a decent job in training you, as many of the enemies here utilise the deflect and counter mechanics. I do appreciate though that while those systems are there, they're optional in the sense that no boss so far requires you to perfect counter. I'm sure had I mastered the mechanic it would make life easier, but it is a level of skill that I don't currently possess. Maybe in the full release I'll change my tune, I'd love to give it more of a go. Hey all, sorry to be a bother, but I'm trying to reach 35,000 subscribers by October of 2024. If after finishing this video you like what you see, consider parrying that subscribe button to stay up to date on all my future videos. Back to the regularly scheduled programming. At number 10 we have Rhymeblood Hati of the Undead Legion and Skull the Great Wolf, a gank fight found at the end of the Boreal Outskirts. Before we even get to the gameplay though, I have to say I think the lead up to this fight is phenomenal. One of the best in the mod, some of the best visual storytelling I've seen in a while. As we find out when fighting Kreml, the flame of this land was doused in ice, but it was actually a profaned flame, abyssal in nature. So naturally, the Abyss Watchers would be out and about here. They're a faction that appear in multiple Arch Thrones, and then exploring the Boreal Outskirts, finding the ruined camp with the corpses of the Undead Legion, it sets up this fight beautifully. Hati utilises the Abyss Watcher moveset and the Elden Ring Bloodhound moveset, which is naturally quite aggressive, but I found sidestepping and shielding to be an effective tactic. His poise isn't that high, so interrupting his attacks is doable, which led to us trading damage back and forth while I learned the moveset. But by god, this was another moment where I felt that my damage dealt to the boss was just inadequate. It's funny because I clearly was more than strong enough to take on all the enemies on the path here, but my damage output against Hati and Skull later on was like pricking a giant with a toothpick. I don't mind this though, because it's clear that Hati and Skull are meant to be a hidden optional fight off the beaten path, designed to be faced with a more upgraded weapon. Had my greatsword been at plus 6 and not plus 4, maybe I would have had an easier time. Now spoilers, I did beat them first try but it was within an inch of my life. Multiple moments where I had to hop into a menu to Ember or Humanity because I didn't have it on my quick bar, it was wild, but a great experience that I won't soon forget. Skull joins halfway through the fight, and anyone not aware should now realise this mod is redeeming the Champions Grave Tender and Great Wolf fight from Dark Souls 3. And yeah, you know what, it did it in spades. The wolf is less aggressive compared to his Dark Souls 3 counterpart, not spamming his charge and utilising an ice breath to catch the player off guard. But more importantly, Skull and Hearty switch their passive and aggressive natures throughout the fight. So if you're fighting one enemy, the other will silently watch. Now I do think they could afford to tweak this element a tiny bit. I think about Lies of P, and how in the first Black Rabbit Brotherhood fight, when two enemies were on the field, the eldest brother would hang back, but every now and then use a simple to dodge move to keep the player on their toes. For example, once in a while Skull could use his single charge, while Hearty could use that one Abyss Watcher move where they slide along the floor with their blade. But that's just me being a little masochistic, I actually think they're balanced extremely well. I also didn't experience this in my playthrough, but if you kill Hati before Skull, the wolf will revive the Abyss Watcher due to his pledge to the Great Wolf's blood. Had that happened, maybe I'd be more stressed, but the wolf felt like the bigger threat and the easier target, bigger hitbox and all that. This fight is definitely on the right track, brilliant stuff devs, you redeemed one of my least favourite boss fights in the series. Now let's see you redeem the reindeer from the frigid outskirts next, I would love to see that. At number 9 we have Aldrich, Saint of the Deep. Found at the end of the Cathedral of the Deep, I won't lie, I was actually surprised to see we were fighting him this early, and guess what? I thought it was fab! The concept of needing to slay the necromancers as they slowly revive Aldrich was genius, as if you're able to kill them fast enough, Aldrich himself will spawn with less health. 
It's a way of managing your own difficulty, and rewarding players who can one-shot the Deacons with a well-developed build. Once Aldrich spawns, it's a similar situation to the Phalanx from Demon's Souls, only this time, instead of Hoplites, we're facing evil slimes. The battle utilizes a lot of deep miracles, either used by Aldrich himself or those surrounding him. The most dangerous is definitely the Cursed Rain, where clouds form above the player and you have to escape the vicinity of the attack to avoid the deadly status effect. I actually had a moment near the end of the fight where I almost hit Max Curse because I got cocky and kept attacking the boss, which led to me needing to take around 30 seconds to let the status effect decrease. Normally, I would hate that. But here, the challenge of the fight is in managing your own aggression. It's different to the other fights that utilize Curse, as the move is designed to force you to retreat, as opposed to being a move designed to just attack you. There's a lot of thought put into it. Sometimes a slime will cast dark magic projectiles, but will also become defenseless, so a single hit takes them out. I really love this balancing, as it gives Aldrich range against the player, but also gives you a way to counter it. It's the Deacons of the Deep done right. I also liked the neato style ghost blade attacks that appeared any time Aldrich dove into the sludge. I don't think I dodged a single one to be fair, but I can tell once I know the timing, future runs will be much easier. The coffin at the center of the room really helped to break line of sight so I could heal up or retreat. I could manage the boss, and I could tell that was how it was designed. Everything just worked. It's only this low purely due to personal preference on the type of fights I enjoy. Mechanically, you rocked it, Team Arch Thrones. I'm happy to see that now we've got two great Aldrich fights in Soulsborne. At number 8, we have Saint Klimt, found in the Cathedral of the Deep where you'd normally find the Rosaria's Fingers Covenant in the main game. Now this is a tale of two halves. The first portion of the fight had me giddily grinning from ear to ear, as Klimt seamlessly utilizes the Godskin Apostles moveset from Elden Ring, stretching across the arena. What I wasn't expecting though was the morbid nature of the boss room, a large circular dais with corpses outstretched into the air, and with the knowledge that the cathedral was giving Bloodborne the house down boots, I knew there had to be something else to this fight. Naturally I was right, but I couldn't have predicted what was coming. As he retreats to the center at half health, he summons a group of the Rosaria's fingers, dives headfirst into the blood, and moments later bursts forth, this gigantic pulsating mass of flesh and gore filling the center of the arena, and it took me a few moments to process that I was looking at the familiar form of the One Reborn from Bloodborne. Immediately though, this fight is better than Bloodborne because the boss doesn't vomit acid onto the ground that stagger kills you like the One Reborn. Instead, there are puddles that form after he spawns, which cause bleed damage, but vanish after a few seconds and to my knowledge weren't ever summoned again. Instead, Klimt chooses to focus on magic in this phase. This mostly involves homing angelic arrows that target the player. Initially used in short bursts, when he gets low enough on health, it's used like a Gatling gun but more than manageable. Then there's the ability to summon Sludge above the player's position that you've got to roll out of the way to avoid. It's an attack that caught me off guard multiple times, but always had an element of fairness to it. Klimt takes away the more tedious aspects of the One Reborn while combining this phase with one of my favorite boss movesets from Elden Ring in Phase 1, making for the most memorable cathedral fight. Given I imagine they can't do mid-fight cutscenes for phase transitions, what they came up with to accommodate for those is fantastic. Klimt is a boss I can't wait to face again when the full game launches, I'm really looking forward to it, but I've gotta be honest, between him and Aldrich, the cathedral is looking good. At number 7, we have the Keeper of the Old Gods, found in the Cathedral of Blue. Also known as the famed hero Flynn, he's a thief who uses the cathedral as his refuge from the law, but takes you for a trespasser after you enter. If you weren't sure that Phoenix Tower was the Sekiro-inspired level, Keeper of the Old Gods straight up takes inspiration from Ishin Ashino with his moveset. He has a variety of hard-hitting sword-swing combos that you either have to perfectly block, shield, or dodge through, lest you incur the wrath of bleed buildup. That's the true killer in this fight. If your stagger is broken even once, Flynn will capitalize and demolish and bleed you to death. 
in a way that feels extremely brutal. Flynn can also deflect attacks too, so you'll go for a hit, only to get punished yourself. I'd like to say this is a fight you can't brute force your way through, and I mostly agree with that assessment. Had I stuck with my greatsword, I think I'd still be struggling with the fight to this day. But switching to the great mace finally gave me the damage I needed to just barely survive the encounter as a strength build. The toughest part of Flynn's moveset comes when he starts breaking out the wind attacks, utilizing the Ashina Cross and Ishin's various wind slices from his final boss appearance. With such a small room, and me knowing I couldn't deflect all these attacks due to the bleed buildup, I had to learn my roll timings to perfection to be able to punish the rogue, and eventually I was able to come out on top. If you're not a master of the deflection mechanic, this is probably going to be the hardest fight in the demo. In fact, it's definitely the bout I died to the most throughout my playtime. He had one combo in his enraged state that I'd always get clipped by, leading to me getting hit four times, having bleed proc, and killing me immediately. It drove me up the wall. But he's one of those fights I really want to practice more. I can tell that once I'm on the same skill level, Flynn could feel fantastic to fight. And he's an optional battle, which means I'm not bothered by his high difficulty. I do find it funny though that defeating him is how you access a secret boss in Phoenix Tower, but the secret boss is way easier by comparison. The only thing I dislike is that Flynn is the other boss in this demo that kills you upon depleting his health bar. Yes, it shows the skill difference between the player and the boss, but I think having Flynn just retreat with a line of dialogue implying for you to come see him in his room would have worked just as well. Dying at the end here, at least to me, just felt like a bit of a slap in the face. Also, Flynn is voiced by Varty Vidya, which is just iconic. I love that for him. Although I was half expecting Flynn to announce a Displate sponsorship or something during his post-battle dialogue. It was just the inflection was so good. <laughs> At number 6, we have the Angel of Gertrude, a hidden boss that can be found in the arena of the Curse Rotted Greatwood from the main game. This was one of the first bosses I encountered in my playthrough, as I wanted to explore every inch of the War Torn Village before progressing to the next Arch Throne. And on my first attempt, I actually think I did okay. The Angel of Gertrude is based on the Crucible Knight moveset from Elden Ring, but with less aggression and more of a focus on holy magic. It has the usual sword and shield moveset with big bulky swings, and a teleport dive bomb attack that I found pretty easy to dodge. I like that if you look closely, you can also see where the boss is teleporting via the faint angelic light it gives off. At half health though, the angel splits into two, summoning a lance variant that will fight by its side. In my first run, these two enemies proceeded to spam the light discus attack at me, which didn't feel particularly great. But after going through the Cathedral and Carthus, I returned to give them another go. What I didn't realise initially was that both angels are tied to the same health bar, Dark Lurker style, meaning the smart move likely should have been me attacking the Spear Angel after it spawns since it has no shield to block attacks. I didn't do that. For the most part, I found the aggression of the angels fine, I never felt overwhelmed once I was correctly leveled, and aside from the aforementioned moment of magic spam, the pair never felt like their attacks were unfairly overlapping. I actually had a moment where I perfect deflected the spear angel's attack, and my brain immediately went, ooh, that's interesting. It's why I think, to get the most out of this mod, getting good at the secular deflection mechanic will be important, as I suspect there are a ton of different interactions you can trigger with the right reflexes. I suspect some will find this fight overwhelming or will be against it because Duo Crucible Knight moveset, but for me it struck a nice balance. It also helped that the bosses looked absolutely gorgeous. The white wings and the modelling work on the armour was perfection. I love the dichotomy between bosses like the Omen and the Pus Ridden Beast, versus the Angel of Gertrude and the Angelic Siege Golem showing two sides of the same war happening in the same zone. At number 5 we have the Angelic Siege Golem, likely the first boss players will find in the Arch Thrones demo. Found at the end of the War Torn Village before the bridge to Lothric, this golem guards the gates and must be felled for you to progress. 
The Siege Golem naturally takes inspiration from the Tower Knight, and the Iron Golem, where the boss starts off as this imposing, tanky creature, giant axe in hand, but with the right strategy can be felled like any other. Its ankles are of course its weak point, attack a leg long enough, and an angelic white ring will appear around it. Now, in my first attempt at the boss, I mistakenly thought this meant I needed to keep attacking this leg further, but it's actually the opposite. It means you've done enough damage to that limb, and now attack the other leg. Once you do enough damage to both, the golem will fall to the ground, allowing you to attack the head for a short amount of time. I'll admit though, I had a few issues with this mechanic, because multiple times, the golem would fall in such a way where the head would be poking out of the arena, making it impossible for me to capitalize on my efforts. After a third of the health is depleted, the angelic side of the golem then takes charge. It begins summoning angelic projectiles that home in on your position. It can slam the ground beneath it with an angelic AoE that has a deceptive range and dodge timing and it can do the classic ranged light slash through the air, one that caught me off guard because the second slice often comboed into other attacks. Personally, as this is the first boss most players will face, I think its moveset is a little on the intense side. I actually feel like the light slashes are a bit much, or at least shouldn't show up until the half health point, as that's when the golem gets its most powerful attack, teleporting to one side of the arena and launching a gigantic horizontal light beam across the floor, before rushing the player and leaping at them, slamming its axe down with brutal white light. I can tell so much thought was put into this guy's moveset, and the way the fight escalates as it goes along, but even though this was the first boss I defeated, that was only after I did a little bit of leveling up by checking the other four arch thrones. This may just be me, and fair warning, I am going to go on a little tangent right now, so bear with me, but I feel like the arch thrones mod is almost afraid of having easy bosses. Everything has a gimmick, or a gotcha moment, or a tanky health bar, which works if you're aiming to capture the hardcore Souls fanbase who are already used to this type of gameplay, I definitely love a good gimmick or a gotcha, but Arch Thrones is almost certainly going to appeal to a wider audience, as news outlets and YouTubers will pick up the mod. It's got the publicity to bring in a lot of the more casual fans, and many of them are going to be turned away because there's no quote-unquote easy boss to ease them in and give them an early sense of success. You go to the war-torn village as your first arch throne, so most players are going to think, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be, I should be able to beat the bosses here. And of the four bosses in the zone, one is a hidden two-phase boss fight, one is a secret gank boss that deals a high amount of damage, one is an exceptionally aggressive and tanky creature that will scare away most players if you don't have any fire, which leaves the Siege Golem as the only candidate for that first boss players will try to defeat. And before the light magic comes in, it actually does give off that energy, but the moment the projectiles and the light slashes and the AoE appear, which is after only a third of the health bar, the difficulty of the fight, at least to me, spikes a tad too high. Maybe if the light AoEs could appear after you knock the boss down for the first time, I think the balance would feel a little more appropriate. Absolutely fabulous fight still, don't get me wrong, I'm saying all of this out of love for the mod, but I guess it's just food for thought, it's just how I process things when I played. At number 4, we have Necromancer Obidiah, found in the Far Temple of the Sands of Carthus. While I think some of the bosses have a few balancing issues, Necromancer Obadiah is not one of them. I actually was pleasantly surprised by his moveset, as he strikes a nice balance between melee attacks and his ranged Dark Flames. His main attack is this dash forwards where he swings his blade in a circular fashion, before following it up with another strike and a point-blank flame blast. When too close to you, he'll use the Dark Souls backflip to regain some distance before launching into either another combo or sending trails of Black Flame to hit you from afar. He can also charge Black Flame heavy strikes if you're close, but I found them very easy to dodge due to their slow windup. I've used the term balance a lot in this video, but Obadiah is genuinely perfect for his spot in the game, assuming you've got a decent damaging weapon like I had. 
At half health, he'll summon a horde of skeletons to disrupt the flow, but he'll keep his distance from you while they're alive, using his black flame trails to try and snipe you. The problem for him is that those trails also hurt his minions, which I really like, as you can use the boss's own strength against him. I normally don't vibe with minions in boss fights, but it works really well here, so I didn't have any issues. After he hits his enraged state, he coats most of his melee attacks with black flame, and his combos get longer and more intricate. Some create cones of dark flames you've got to roll through to dodge, it's a nice difficulty progression overall, where he's still using many of his phase 1 moves, but with new permutations. My best advice is always just to stay as close as possible to Obadiah, because you can often avoid his dark flame ranged attacks by just rolling inwards around his side. I just don't really have anything negative to say. He's got a great battle flow, rewards careful dodging, and was one of those bosses that my playstyle was perfectly suited to face off against. No notes, I just really enjoyed the top three a tad bit more. At number three, we have Janara One-Eye, the first boss of the Elium Lois Archthrone. An oracle and disciple of Alsana from Dark Souls 2, if I'm reading the lore correctly, she fights with an element of grace, using slow, methodical twists and twirls. She can do a lot of damage, but her moveset is based on the corrupted monk from Sekiro, which means I suspect she's weak to being deflected. I didn't do that. I opted to dodge most attacks and shield through those I couldn't avoid, which worked out fine. Janara is definitely a glass cannon, she can dish the pain out, but her health pool is lower than the average, so had I had my great mace instead of my great sword at this point, I don't think she would have given me much trouble. And with a heavy strength weapon, you can get a guaranteed stagger on her before the midpoint of the fight. Perhaps why Janara lands so high for me is actually her special attack. She'll vanish from the battlefield for a moment, coating the area in a snowstorm before attacking you with five ghostly apparitions. It's an updated version of the True Corrupted Monks Phase 2 that nobody ever saw because most of us used the Sekiro tree cheese for that fight, so forcing me to deal with that mechanic was karma more than anything else. I really think it fit Janara's style, and none of the attacks felt hard to predict or dodge, always coming out in the same order each time, so you can learn the timings as you progress. Most of her attacks remain the same in her enraged state, only she can charge a few frostbite floor trails, and there's less time between each of her combos. Pro tip though, consider completing her fight with Sorig first, as you can use the summon sign to enter his world and get free retries at the fight. It gives you practice, lets you seal her moves, and if you win, it's proof you can beat the fight with just three Estus flasks. At number two, we have the Hide Phoenix, a hidden boss found at Phoenix Tower. This will be the most controversial take on this list, as I've seen multiple posts and threads about how the Phoenix is unfair, or brutal, or hard, etc, and I do actually agree to an extent, we will get there. To summon the Phoenix, you have to purchase the horn from Flynn, and take it to the arena near the first bonfire where you fight a Dark Wraith. Then turn to Phoenix Tower, and watch the fireworks. The Hyde Phoenix has two forms. The first is the Chimera, which it'll use for the first half of the fight. Here you've got the usual lunges, claw swipes, and bites, with the occasional tail whip for good measure. One attack I really like is the hind leg kick. It punishes players who try to hide near the tail, and it just looks funny seeing the player get knocked back. The Phoenix naturally uses fire magic as its main form of offense. Its flame attack involves it flying into the air and landing at another point in the arena, and when it lands, it'll send a cone of flames in your direction you have to roll through. Aside from that though, there's not much in the way of flames until it hits half health and the Phoenix reveals its true form. Watching the boss fly away from the arena and into the Phoenix Tower itself so it can rain meteors down on the player is without a doubt genuinely the coolest part of this entire mod. It's spectacle at its finest, and I discovered that as the meteors always hit the same place, there were player messages that revealed safe spots for me to stand so I wouldn't take damage. 
The Phoenix will then return, switching between Chimera and Bird Form, using a larger range of fire spells, from homing fireballs to the aforementioned fire waves, to a gigantic fireball AoE that will then explode into more homing fireballs. And it all combos together to create a really intense fight on top of all the melee attacks from Phase 1. But while I ranked the Hyde Phoenix at number 2 for the spectacle and the sheer amount of work that went into making this fight as unique and interesting as it is, it does have two major flaws. One is that the lock-on system just does not work with this fight. You'll often have moments where the boss flies up above you and you'll assume he's gonna land behind you, right? But then you spend three seconds circling your camera only to see the boss in a spot you couldn't have predicted. This would be fine if you didn't need to keep track of the boss's position to avoid major damage. The second issue is that the boss has almost no downtime between attacks. I'd be near as he ends his combo, but before I can attack, the phoenix would then fly out of reach, and it happened enough times that it felt like a design choice by the developers. But it's one that I really, really hated. With how intense the attacks can be, giving the player almost no downtime to actually get a hit in before waiting 10 to 15 seconds for another attack to end is just not very fun. I adore this fight, but it needs to be slowed down ever so slightly in the second phase. Just give an extra half a second before the AI goes off into its next attack and I think it would be the perfect level of difficulty. Though as it stands I didn't find it exceptionally hard, Unlike our number one. At number one, we have Kreml, God of Struggle. A fitting title, as when you first face this boss, the struggle is real. <laughs> Kreml is a two-phase boss fight taking place in the frozen chaos. You have to take on his Radagon-based moveset, dodging his mace attacks and getting those hits in where you can. I found the timing pretty tough at first, because many of the attacks come out on a delay, but by the time I had my winning run, I had the dodge timing down. In his first phase, he'll start off with pure melee, but as his health ticks down, he'll start throwing ice spells into the mix. Trails of ice across the floor that build up frostbite. A frost stomp followed by an AoE slam from the sky. An ice attack that fires frost shards in a small radius around him, it's all there. Perhaps the hardest aspect of the fight, though, are the Lois Knights he summons midway through. He'll smash open the icicles containing those very same knights we worked with in Dark Souls 2, and they'll aggro onto you for the first phase of the fight. You might think to kill them, as if you're hit by the sword of the first knight, it'll stagger you in place until its combo finishes, which does a lot of damage and doesn't let you attack Kreml. But keeping them alive is important, as when he hits phase 2, he becomes Kreml Profaned Deity, his moveset shifting to a variation of Artorius, where the flames of chaos burn through his form, and the Lois Knights remember their mission, proceeding to switch sides and take down Kreml alongside you. Without them, I don't think I could have won on my own. Kreml is absolutely brutal, his melee attacks constantly chipped me with the fire effect, and his aggression is off the charts. But having other opponents to split his attention allowed me opportunities to get in sneaky hits and take advantage of staggers. Also side note, I love that they included the frenzy projectile attack from Elden Ring, because that association helped to tell the story of Kreml being overcome by the flames he was unable to keep under control. It took a lot of attempts, and I mean a lot of attempts to get Kreml down, but by the end it was worth the effort. The fight was balanced around the other knights being there to break aggro, and the challenge is in finishing the fight before you're the only one left to be targeted, and it conveyed that brilliantly. Such a spectacle, I can visualise a phase change cutscene in my head that would have looked so cool. This was such a brilliant job, Archthrones devs, thank you so much for this amazing boss fight. And that's my list. Which Archthrones boss was your favourite? Let me know down below, and be sure to check out the Archthrones mod using the link in the description, and remember to parry that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my future videos. A massive shout out once again to the entire Arch Thrones team, this demo was a thing of beauty. I am so floored by the sense of scope and the amount of content that you guys have put out, it is absolutely insane and I am genuinely wishing you all the best.
my socials are on screen now. I'd recommend my Twitter. It's the best place to contact me. A massive shout out to my YouTube channel members for supporting me for another month. You're amazing. It costs $4.99 and gets you early access to my Tuesday videos when applicable, plus a shout out in the description and credits of each video. And a massive shout out to my patrons over on Patreon for your continued support also. I'll be phasing Patreon out in June, but for now, thanks for the help. Now then, I'll see you next time for another video. Adios.